Hey, how's it going? I'm happy. This is me happy. This is what my face looks like. Since I was a kid, I never knew what my face looked like. Like, my emotions and what this thing is doing, they don't always add up. I remember uh, thinking that I would be mad and, like, like, have my mad face on. And then, like, holding that face, going to the mirror and looking at the mirror, and I just I looked the same as I always do. That's why I don't try acting, because I, I have a huge disconnect from my body language and facial expressions to how my mind feels. But anyways, so... I have recorded three interviews, and so I'll be recording these intros for them, and then I'll get those episodes coming out hopefully sooner than later. I've got a lot going on. This isn't the most important thing in my life, so it happens when it happens. But I thank you for listening and finding some interest in it. It is fun. It's kind of like a hobby. That's what this is. This is a hobby. Other other guys my age play softball and join uh, softball co-ed softball leagues whatever and, and that's their thing this is my thing anyways <laughs> i don't know what to say i've been overwhelmed i've been very overwhelmed i have too many things going on and i'm trying to i got to get a couple of them done and then i'm not going to take on more things i do this every year it is also January now, so it's the beginning of 2024. It's like the 15th or 16th today. I think the 16th. But I every year I always try to take on more work. And then within a few months I realize I can't and I have to scale back. And maybe I can I've I figure out a way to do just a smidge more work. But it's like I do too much and then have to scale back to what I can handle. And then each year I try to get my life organized enough to do a little bit more of what I want to do and a little bit more of what I need to do while also feeling like I'm in control of my own life and getting to have fun with my family and enjoy my time on this earth. I have been in that headspace lately where all of like the like societal things that there are to do, hanging out and participating with society is getting annoying I, I do this every year dude it's always it's this it's so frustrating and the, the the sweet spot would be to not care about anything that is off-putting to you and then also have a good time i've been there before it's wonderful but i, I know when i'm getting too petty i'm not fulfilled in my own in my own areas of uh or i guess i'm not fulfilled in my own life and that usually means my priorities or my headspace is is on the wrong thing. Because life's awesome. I have a wonderful wife, a wonderful family. I get to make music and play music for a career. Um, I'm surrounded by people I love. Uh, I make enough money to not be suffocating. Things are trending upward. I don't know why I get so sad. I don't want to call it seasonal def effectiveness disorder. It could be that. I don't know. It's freaking cold right now. It's like 11 degrees outside. We're having that, what do they call that? The, the, the vortex, the winter polar vortex or whatever it is. That's hitting Texas right now. And the other morning it was like four degrees. Haley woke me up and she was like, we got to go see what four degrees feels like. Or maybe it was the feels like was negative four or something like that. Four, negative four. All I know is I was uh, tired and cold and I did not get up and go see what it feels like. But I don't think she did either. I was really impressed that she wanted to, though. She's always cold. So the fact that she was like, we got to go see it. I should have done it. I should have done it. You know when you're like half asleep and the waking world and the dream world kind of feel like the same thing and you, you can't... I just get so... I'm so confused for like the first 30 minutes of waking up every day. I don't... So yeah, my sister used to, when she was in college and I was like in 11th grade or something, she would be up late studying, she'd get bored and she'd call me and she, we'd have like whole conversations. I'd wake up, I'd answer the phone, we'd have whole conversations. I wouldn't remember them. We'd make plans for when she was coming in town and I wouldn't remember. She never got mad at me though. She kind of thought it was funny. So that's good. But I do have an interview coming up with Jordan Shepard. We call him Jay Shep. At least that's but I don't know if I call him that. I don't have it yet. But I, people call him Jay Shep, which is a cool nickname. I call him Jordan Shepard or Jordan. Um, wonderful, handsome, gifted young man. 
and we had a fun conversation. We have a lot of similarities while also having totally different experiences growing up, but kind of similar. I don't know. I challenge all of you to go talk to people and ask about their life growing up and find out if you want to like remind yourself that even though you're an individual, we're all kind of a little bit of a product of our environment. Um, do talk to more people and hear about their life and you realize we've all kind of had our own different versions of the same things if that makes sense but anyways we're, we're living in a time where where it's uh, identity is the main focus of everything and you're an individual and your identity matters and all that and that's fine i'm not against any of that i just i also think that we're a lot more alike than people want to admit i mean we're all humans we were all born. We're all we all learn to read. We learn to to talk. I mean, I guess not everyone learns to read or talk, but there's a whole bunch of people who don't learn to read and don't talk who have that in common. You know what I mean? If the camera just shook, it's because my foot. I have the pretend wood floors, so they're like this is pretend ground that I'm on. Anyways, um. I'd love to expand on some of these thoughts. I don't feel like I have a ton of clarity on them. Sometimes I hit a flow state and I can express myself the way I want, but right now I'm kind of distracted because I'm trying to listen to some music while I do this and it's a freaking ad playing in my ears because I don't pay for Spotify. I hate advertisements. They're so annoying. That's another thing that uh, they, they capitalize on that. You're an individual. Uh, why? You're not like everyone else, so why should your mattress be the same for everyone else? It's stupid stuff like that. It's like, hey, shut up. Don't talk to me that way. Just sell me what you're trying to sell me, and I'll buy it or I won't buy it. Stop, stop with this fake flattery. That's what it is. It doesn't feel genuine. And a lot of this uh, rhetoric about like loving yourself right now, it doesn't really feel genu genuine. But... Maybe that's my fault. Maybe that's where I'm consuming it. I'm going to take a social media fast, I think. I I just, I, I dream of a life where the, the physical realm, real outside, <laughs> real people, that's, that's what I want to spend my time thinking about and being around and I don't know. I don't mean to come off blue. I, I am happy, but I'm also blue. What's another word for that? I can't think of it, but there's a better descriptive. Melancholy? I think that's the word I was looking for. Melancholy. That's kind of how I feel. Ah, anyways. Um, <laughs> there's a song playing that just started on my head, uh, headphones. It's by the band Inner Shikari. It's called Airfields. And boy, lyrically, he's hitting exactly where I'm at right now. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed with reality and uh, being alive and what you're supposed to do and clarifying what, how you should be spending your time alive and I don't know, maybe not everyone needs goals. I feel like I need a thing to work towards while also feeling like, <laughs> like I don't want anyone to tell me what to do and I just want to make of this time the way I want to, but then it doesn't work that way and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not mad about any of it. I feel like I'm talking in circles and none of this makes sense, so I'm sorry if you listen to all this, but that's how I've been feeling. Uh, this is why I try to hang out with friends and laugh and be silly all the time because if I get, if I'm alone too much, I can get in this headspace and it's stupid. But anyways, Jordan Shepard, the man, awesome guitar player. He's in the band City of Auburn and they are so good. None of this. I, I, I messed that up. Let me let me try that again. Okay. So we're going to cut to my interview with Jordan Shepard. Wonderful man. Wonderful guitar player. Wonderful friend. Wonderful songwriter. He's in the band City of Auburn. And I hope you enjoy our conversation. It was a lot of fun. So here we go.
I also feel like I need to clarify, we recorded this interview in like November, so we probably talk about getting ready for Christmas and that's already over. And that's, that's my bad. Anyways, see you. Start talking. Yeah. And um, okay, so what we were saying earlier when I stopped you, we were talking about Qatar Center and yeah. um, Chris Suarez. Mm-hmm. I feel bad saying her name on here, but we're only going to say good things. Yeah. Uh, she's like a, a real one over there. Oh, yeah. So, the, one of the OGs. So you, you, she was one of the first ones you were buying stuff from? Yeah, yeah. I bought, um, well, I, as a, I think it was a birthday or Christmas present when I was like nine or 10. I got one of the Squire mini strats, like the bright red one that was like 80 bucks. Uh-huh. Um, and then after I outgrew that, I went and bought myself a, uh, a Squire affinity strat, a sunburst one. I'd always loved sunburst yeah. fenders. I still do. Um, but I bought it. She was the one that helped me find that one. I, I kind of knew what I wanted when I went in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, every day I've gone into that guitar center specifically, I'm pretty sure she's been there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When my when I first, I think it was two thousand, maybe the end of two thousand six, somewhere in there, I got my. Uh, I started buying pedals. Mm. Can't remember what happened, but I, I something made me get into wanting pedals, you, like the Mars Volta or something. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so I went and I was playing with that Boss Wall. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Yeah, had all the I pedals think they on? still have that. And um, I was playing with the Green Phaser, mm-hmm. and then like the DD three or five or whatever at the time. And I was getting some cool sounds, and I saved up money, and I got the phaser first. Mm-hmm. And I realized, oh, man, the delay was really what was... Yeah. Like, the phaser's cool, and I loved that pedal, and I sold it. That was a big regret for me. Mm-hmm. I want it again. But uh, to me, having that in front of a delay is what made it special. It By itself, I didn't know... I didn't write stuff Phasers that have that. never really... I've never really had... It's like, I, I put a phaser on, like, I'd rather just use a chorus. If I'm going to get... If I'm going for that kind of... If warbly you, sort of thing there was a sound on the phaser that if you went to the uh oh, i can't remember it was like setting all the way to the right on mm-hmm. the knob all the way to the right mm-hmm. it's called the step mm-hmm. and it didn't do a smooth transition mm-hmm. it kind of stepped it and oh then you could nice turn the depth all the way up mm-hmm. and then it had this really kind of digital uh almost, almost like, arpeggio yeah, kind of sounding yeah, thing yeah. on it and that was really fun to mess yeah with. that's cool um Okay, and then, uh, okay, so yeah, so this is why I'm glad we started with Guitar Center, because I wanted to say, so one of, some of my earliest memories of you are when I was working at Guitar Center, and I worked in the recording department, so mm-hmm. I wasn't in the guitars, mm-hmm. but I remember I would always start hearing a really awesome tone in these really cool licks, and I'd go see who was playing, and it was you, and I don't know if huh. I ever told you that. No, you never did. But yeah, dude, because you would come in on like your lunch break or something. I just, just periodically. Periodically, yeah. you'd come in and jam. And there was two people, you and Eric Jones mm-hmm. were two people whose style was so specific and I really liked it mm. that I could be working and I'd hear it and I'd be like, I bet that's the, and I'd go check and I'd be like, oh, I'm right. It's that, you. that is like, that is one of the highest compliments I can get as a guitarist is that I'm identifiable simply by the sound. You are, you are, that, you did. That means a lot to me. Thank you, dude. Yeah. You got a really cool and it shows up in your music that you release, uh, City of Auburn. Mm-hmm. And I just, you have a really cool, um, your tone. And it's funny because the, the, whether you were plugged into any amp and depending, it, you could be using any guitar, the tone and the style still felt like, oh, I know who's, who's cool. playing that. That at, at times it can feel a little gimmicky because it feels like I just kind of do the same thing over and over again. It doesn't sound like it. But I, at the same time, I, I feel like I, I'm really... I'm enjoying the the style and the sensibilities I've developed just from the cacophony of influences I've amassed over the years. But um, at times it can feel like I, I lack a little bit of creativity. At times I kind of just fall back on the same tropes over and over again. But there's also something within those things that kind of feels like home base, and that's kind of where I always want to start from. Mm. Um and like I'll hear like even it depend doesn't matter what the gig is if it's you know playing here or playing or writing for City of Auburn or playing with whoever I'm playing with I'll there are things that I'll like oh I hear I heard this kind of thing at this gig or in this song that sounds like something that'd be cool here let me try something out but make it my own mm-hmm. um, and 
I think that's that's the fun of being a musician and being a guitar player is like, okay, I'm playing alt rock, but there's something that I heard in a Tears for Fears song that really felt good. And it almost kind of feel I'm getting that same feeling here. I want to mess with that. Yeah, it's almost like you you pick up different tools or mm-hmm. or flavors from other artists, and you think, now what would I do with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you, it, it's not you're not making the same thing as them. You're just right. taking the ingredients and then saying, what would I do if I had some? Yeah. Well, and that was a conversation I had with. Michael, the singer in City of Auburn, is um, like I was like I was getting, I was listening to a lot of uh, the band Camino. Uh, mm-hmm. Their album Try Hard, I think, is a masterpiece, um, both on a songwriting and arranging level, but also the production is just phenomenal. But I was telling him, I was like, I'm not trying to be the band Camino, but there's a lot of textures and feelings I get from that record that I'd like to work with, and not necessarily replicate but like integrate into things i'm writing and it's really simple stuff like it could be just the the pacing and the tempo of something or um just like an effect over like interwoven into a part like uh i was working on a demo where it's kind of a you know standard caveman drop d riff but i put this really chorused out guitar like a higher lead line over that i was like that's that's the the thing that kind of warbly lead with a really solid foundation under it i was like it it feels like the band camino but it also feels like me oh that's cool um and learning how to um take inspiration without um directly copying somebody that's a really hard thing to learn how to do because it's like i'll put that i'll put a sound together that feels very much like a like i'll put a sound together that's like oh this definitely sounds like under oath then I don't end up writing an under oath riff. I write a riff yeah. that's mine, but it came from a place of, I like the way this made me feel. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to take that and what would I do with that? Mm-hmm. Um, and I've started, I've tried to do that with, uh, like I'll take pop songs that I really like and be like, okay, I think this song is a really well-written song and it's it's got a cool energy to it, but what would it sound like if I had written and arranged it? So like, like the song structure and melody and stuff, that stays the same. But what if I had written the music for it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I took uh, Castle on the Hill by Ed Sheeran, which I I hear that song everywhere. And I was like, this song's really cool. I like this song a lot, but I needed like that much more energy out of uh-huh. it. So I was like, I think this could be like a, a pop goes punk kind of thing. So I found just the isolated vocal. I dropped it into Pro Tools and was like, okay clean slate how would i write this song and it took me about a year to finish it oh wow but once i finished i was like that's really cool have you released that i haven't i put a little clip of it on tiktok a while back but i feel like were you playing along with it yeah i think i saw that yeah you posted on you shared it on facebook yeah and so like doing that that was a fun experiment of how can i what what would i do to, to come into a song that's already written but bring my sensibilities to it. Um, and I've tried to approach writing in general like that. It's like, I'm bringing a, a certain set, uh, to quote uh, an oft-quoted movie, a certain set of skills uh, to the table. What can I do with those skills to make the song better? Or make the song feel as good as it can? Because I, I have a hard time saying like, oh, my way of doing this is better or your way of doing this is worse. It's like, how can we make this feel as good as possible? Mm-hmm. That's a, a common phrase when we're writing for City of Auburn. It's like, I feel like that could feel better. Yeah, Not yeah, yeah. necessarily like that part sucks. It's like the the part's cool. How can we make it feel good? Because something about it doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. And I'm not satisfied with a part until it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. I found like, I found my songwriting got better when... I feel like there was a while where I was writing songs and the songs had a moment I loved. Mm-hmm. And then it took a while to realize I need to like every moment. Yeah. Not just it. Cause I, I mean, I've been writing songs since I was a kid, but like I remember in some of my early punk bands, there's definitely, you go back and listen to parts and you're like, we were just kind of driving through that part mm-hmm. to get to the next part. Yeah. And when you start really going like, I want each part to, to feel awesome. Yeah. I heard Matt Goldman. Mm-hmm. whom you know better than me and uh that's so cool i'm so glad y'all that had still blows experience. my mind like there was one day this is like 
It was probably early, like, probably like May of 2021. He just called me one day. Oh, that's so cool. And, like, I had to double take. I was like, what? What? Okay. And I answered the phone. He's like, hey, are you guys working on anything? I was like, maybe. We, we have some stuff we kind of want to do. He's like, okay, well, if you guys do, I'd like to work with you guys again. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Okay. That's so cool. But you were you were saying you heard Matt Goldman. Yeah, well, he's one of my my heroes oh, as, yeah. as a audio engineer, and he's an amazing producer. I just yeah. love his mind. Um, any band that's recorded an album with him and then put out like a DVD with their studio stuff, mm-hmm. I get because I just want to watch what he's up to. Yeah. Um, but he said one time, if if you keep trying to make a song this much better mm-hmm. in every little spot, at the end. Mm-hmm. It's actually a whole lot better. Yeah. And it was just one of those like, oh, yeah, that's, duh. and that's, that's a huge reason of why we like working with him is because he gets the most out of every single note yeah. in a song. Yeah. And like you can, and it's one of those things like we were doing, cause we just re-recorded uh, a record with him. Uh, and these are songs that have been in the city of Auburn catalog for a while. Like we can get into that whole thing in a little bit. Um, but we were tracking, there were parts we were tracking, and like I played all the notes right, I just didn't play them well. Mm-hmm. And he's like, "You can play that better." I was like, "Yeah, you're right. I can." Even though I got all the notes right, they didn't feel as good as they could. Mm. Um, and he has a really good way of getting that out of you, but not making you feel like you're not playing well. Yeah, he has a way of like he knows there's that that next that that extra gear and somewhere in your hands and in your brain that you can you can get to and he knows how to get that out of people for and that goes for guitar for bass for vocals for drums it's it's a really really cool way and sometimes he he can be really brutal with he's like yeah that was terrible man i i don't know why you're even here and, but but he's 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 got this really dry delivery that's just it, yeah, it tickles my a, funny there's bone something about being able to do that and get a point across directly while yeah. also it being funny enough to not hurt your feelings mm-hmm. jeff rockwell mm-hmm. he's like that or at least he, he was when my band recorded with him in high school mm-hmm. um in like 2005 or six i think we released it in 06 but we were recording with them in 05 and I would be like singing a vocal take and during the take, it would just stop and you'd hear, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just be like, oh my gosh. But it was so funny and it was like jarring and funny that, and you knew I'm just trying to do this really good. Yeah, there was a part that we, uh, we changed uh, a lead line uh, in the middle of recording because he, again, he was like, that doesn't feel as good as it could. Let's, let's mess around with that. Let's find something. And he's very much, uh, we we're very much the spaghetti method when we're recording with him, just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Mm-hmm. And we'd finally found something that felt better, but it was really similar to the original line. And I kept playing the original line. I did it like five takes in a row. And every time he's like, come on, dude, you, you're not that bad. You can do this. <laughs> <laughs> it was he, he's so fun to work with and he's just he's got this great balance of like it's hard work recording a record uh-huh. it doesn't feel like hard work when you're doing it with him that's because awesome. he he's got this great way of like it, it's very like to to quote james modern it's goopy artist brain where you'll like be in the middle of tracking that something like and then him. all of a sudden for no reason you're watching monty python and the holy grail <laughs> and that's that's the way my brain works it's like i'll be like oh yeah this part's great movie <laughs> that's funny jeff rockwell he had um i always loved he had halo in his studio uh, just set up to the side which was brilliant for like high mm-hmm. schoolers yeah because if we weren't recording we could be obnoxious or he had mm-hmm. a great way that whoever wasn't tracking was just over there just playing yep we were playing halo together uh i wanted to tell you did you know that you are the reason that i'm a fan of bill murray really yeah do you know who i why i'm a fan of bill murray uh-uh. because of michael osborne really yeah Really? Yeah, he he turned me on to them, and uh, he I forget which song it was. Uh, it was off of his album called Wet Milk. Yeah, which is I think his best work. Really? Um, it's between Wet Milk and Banana for me. Okay, I like Eggy Pocket. Eggy Pocket's cool, and Wet Milk's great too. Um, Wet Milk, I think front to back flows the best out of any of his albums. But it was it was a song off that I think it was track two, uh, the one that's got the the stupid breakdown at the end. Where he, he's in that real Disney, doom, 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 doom. he sent me that and I was like, it's like, it's, it's meme core to its finest. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Because all the song titles are so dumb, but like somehow match the energy of the song. Uh-huh. 
Um, and then I heard, um, uh, what's the song? Uh, oh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look it up because I need to make. Sure, I, I'm I'm terrible with song titles. Me too. Um, I'm terrible even with my own band song titles. Same, and half of these guys, none of these guys remember the word songs. It doesn't help that I made them all one word because mm -hmm. Eric just goes the Spanish one, you know. <laughs> there will be times like because I, I told you last week, like, I, I listened to the Trees Life playthrough like weekly. Oh. I love that record so much. It's uh, ho uh, Holy Crud. Holy Crud. Uh, it's got that really cool uh, groove at the beginning with that. I'll put, the, I'll put it in this. Um, which I've, I've used that lead line in the middle of church services before because nobody there is going to know it, but I like it. And it when you good. started posting those videos online <laughs> of sneaking in yeah. stuff into church service, that was so funny. You were the first person I ever saw do really? that. Really? Yeah. I'd seen guys sneaking in like Star Wars motifs and I started and seeing stuff that, like that after I saw yours. Okay. Did you do The Office one time on something? No, I haven't done that. I did... Um, I put the, uh, the main hook from uh ordinary world by duran duran Maybe over was... uh revelation song <laughs> it goes kind of hard i'm That's not gonna awesome, lie dude. i've thrown in the uh, fix you line yeah oh i that, at the end i have of, a running uh, joke i have a friend i used to play a bunch of church gigs with and we had a joke of how many songs could i fit that into so many especially like a good one is let it echo mm -hmm. or uh sinking deep or uh -huh. one of those that's just all that kind um of the bridge of what a beautiful name. Perfect for that. <laughs> Especially if you get the, get the right kind of delay and reverb on it. It kind of, everything kind of starts blending together. Yeah. It almost just sounds like the reason it works is because of the, with the worship stuff, yeah. you just need a couple of notes. You just need something that kind of sits there and kind of just starts, every, everything kind of starts to boil up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. Funny. That's a fun one to throw in there. What was the other? I did another one. Um, I did the Bill Murray one, the Duran Duran one, Fix You. Um, I feel like there was another one I, I snuck in there. It may have been a City of Auburn thing. I've probably snuck the intro to There Is Nothing into a song or two. Oh, that's funny. That, that so was, what are you guys up to, City of Auburn? I know you all have some neat stuff coming yeah, up. Yeah, we're playing a show uh, with Emery uh, here in a couple weeks, which is Dude, awesome. not just Emery. Emery and the almost. Yeah, that's gonna be awesome. Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be a good time. Um, we, Where's it at? Uh, it's at Trees. trees it's yeah, cool. we're playing at Trees. We haven't played Trees since before COVID. That was the last um, time we played. It was that was a like a, right before. Ours was. It, I think we played there in like twenty, like early twenty nineteen. So it's it, it it's been a minute. Um, but yeah, we're playing that show, which is gonna be super sick. I'm really excited about that. I mean, I've been listening to Emery since I was in like middle school. Yeah, I, got I had to sneak the Emery. Really early I had to too. sneak the Emery around my parents, which I'm sure we'll get into that that fun. Uh, Let's head there next. Yeah, we'll head there next. Um, but a friend of mine got me a copy. Uh, he had made me a couple of mixed CDs and uh, just kind of starting to enlighten me on the world of music outside of CCM. Who was that friend, or how did you meet them? Uh, it was a, a, a friend. I can't remember how our families ended up meeting, but we were they were some of our closest friends for a long time. Uh, their name's Dylan. I think Dylan lives in Virginia now, and Dylan's one of my favorite humans on planet Earth. Uh, without the influence that Dylan had on my music taste, I probably wouldn't make half of the music I make now. Oh, wow. Um, like Dylan introduced me to everything from like the, the, the gateway into heavier music for Christian kids, you know, kind of the skillet red fire flight tri <laughs> trio. Wait, 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 remind me how old you are again. I'm 28. You're 28. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're going to have a, a yeah. slightly different, but I know, but it's all the same route. Right. It's just <laughs> say, same route, different names. It's like the way I remember the McDonald's playground as a kid versus the way you did it. It's still McDonald's, but they weren't the but we, same. But playground. we both remember Yellow Wendy's, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Dylan introduced me to everything from, from that to Paramore to Emery, Under Oath, August Burns Red, um, and even into stuff like mastodon and all that kind of stuff wow um but every yeah, now and one, then there's always one friend yep he just yeah he D D dylan would just bring me like mix cds like here's new, new cool stuff i'm like sweet and then i listen to him I'm like oh my god this is so good it's That's so awesome. much heavier than i'm used to and i don't know if i'm allowed to like that but <laughs> i do uh, um, that's awesome yeah and uh i remember and then when i was in I mean, it was when it came out, so I would have been 
14, 15 at the time when In Shallow Seas from Emery came out. I got a copy of that for my birthday from a buddy of mine. And dude, I. The first like four songs on that album, dude, one after another. That whole record, I, I, don't, I don't. That record has some really cool ebbs and flows that aren't what you would normally think of in an Emery record or in it really just like a kind of a alt heavy ish hardcore ish record. I don't really know how to d- describe Emery anymore. Cause it's, it's like they have these really cool, like really heavy moments. And then it's other stuff. It's like, this is beautiful. Yeah. Well, isn't one of their albums called we do what we want. Or something yeah, like pretty that? much. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, but I got a copy of in shallow season. I listened to that CD so much after about two, three years, it stopped playing. Oh wow! Uh, but luckily, that was right as Spotify was starting to come along. So I was like, "Oh, okay, I'm I'm fine now." Um, but then that same friend, uh, he and I flew to Seattle in April when Emery did in Shallow Seas front to back one night oh, only. Wow! Um, the same friend that bought me the album in the first place. How was that? Oh my god, that was that show was amazing. Because not only that, we were both we're both big fans of the classic crime, and they played that night too. That makes sense, yeah. Um, and like the classic crime played just all of the bangers from their from their catalog and it was also an album release show for them they put a new record out and i listened to that record on the plane on the way there and it's really good i think i remember when what year was this this was earlier this year okay i think i saw them promoting yeah. that online yeah and uh we, i mean that show it was packed it was at uh, numos in seattle which is so sick. I bet that was awesome. Um, and Emery, they played in Shallow Seas front to back, and then they played, I think they may have played two others. I think they played Studying Politics and Walls, because obviously yeah, you yeah, kind of yeah. have to. Yeah. Um, but it was, that show, that it, it felt so good and so special to be there. And it's, it's not even one of those things where like when they announced that they were doing, they were going to tour that show, that I felt like, oh, I've been gypped out of a, a special experience because now everyone else is going to get to see that. Like, I'm still so happy I got to go see them do that in Seattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when we saw that they were coming through uh, for uh, that tour, coming through here, we were like, let's see if we can get on some of this. So we got that going on. That's so cool. Um, we, uh, we re-recorded uh, an old record of ours, or kind of re-recorded. So we, right when I joined the band in 2016... Uh, Michael had already written and started recording uh, the band's first full-length album, which was called Bloom at the time. And I only played two things on that record. I played two guitar solos. Um, and so I, I wasn't super involved in the recording process. And I also didn't know much about recording at the time. I was still learning a lot. And that record came out and it just... No fault of our own. It, it definitely sounds like a band's first record that wasn't done professionally. Um, but we really liked the songs. The songs themselves are really good. And I think this was one of the earliest conversations I had with Josh. Um, Josh asked us one night, do y'all feel like the drop in quality from how those songs sound live to how they sound on the record is a detriment to y'all's ability to gain fans? And we said yes. He's like, "Cool, take it off the internet, stop selling it." So we did. Wow. Uh, we took that record off the internet um, and stopped playing those songs. So we put "Spinning" out shortly after that. Um, I love that. I have that record. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm still very, very proud of that record. Uh, that the the story of how that record came together is a whole a whole rigmarole. That was a, a hell of a story. Um. But we stopped playing those songs. We, we we would play one or two of them every now and then if it really fit the vibe. Like, we opened for uh, Being as an Ocean last year. Was that last year? Yeah, last February. Uh, I saw them play in the grass at Cornerstone 08. That's awesome. And I was like, this band is awesome. They're so sick. And they're the <laughs> sweetest dudes. Yeah. We had such a great time playing with them. Uh, but we, we broke out, I think, two of the songs from uh, from Bloom for that show. Cause Mike was very influenced by some of their oh, earlier cool. work. There was a lot of that influence in that record. Um, and so we were like, we, we kind of, we got to play those and they, 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 they're so much fun to play live, but we were like, if we want to keep playing these songs, cause we really want to keep playing these songs, we need to re-record the record and we need to put a version of it out that we're proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we hit up 
Goldman were like, hey, here's what we're wanting to do. Um, there's not really much to do in the way of pre-production. It's like we already know the songs. The songs are pretty much all already written. Um, but we we did take we took one song off of the record from the original and added in two new ones. One of the new ones we wrote years ago. We wrote before way before COVID. We played it live once. It was the last show we played before COVID. That was the only time we played that one. And we really, really liked that song. We put that one in, and then we wrote a new song right before we re-recorded the record. Um, but we just we finished that. We finished recording that in January. Um, but we're still just kind of trying to figure out how we want to put it out. Because if we're going to put a record out, we want to do it right. We mm -hmm. want to do it in a way that's going to actually help and work for us, um, and kind of bring actually bring benefit to the band, not just putting a record out for the sake of putting a record out. Um, but I'm really, I'm really stoked on how that turned out. We've got one of the songs out now. It's called Indecision. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I, I really like that song. Yeah, I did all listen to that up here. I, d I used to not like that song. Huh. Um, so we'd play it live and it just, it always felt just super boring and kind of, I don't know, it just, it lacked the oomph that I wanted out of it. But when we re-recorded it this time, we were able to kind of add that. Oomph. And the thing that's been fun about re-recording that record is all the things that we've tweaked and added and modified yeah, over yeah, the years yeah. of playing those songs, we were able to print. That, that's what I like about the live Trees EP yeah. is that you got the the album version and then you start playing them for a while and they mm -hmm. kind of take on a new little bit yeah. of life and it's nice to have. So that's awesome. There's little that. there's little things you they add grow in up. There. Yeah, the songs do grow up. They they kind of start to develop a personality and a um, uh, they almost kind of develop a sense of self. Like you can, like when you're playing the song, you're like, "This song is doing something different tonight than it did last night." Yeah, yeah. Especially like uh, with least of these, our drummer mm -hmm. TJ. Mm -hmm. I always knew, like he played to the vibe of the night, mm -hmm. and not to to uh, like if if the show was really bad, he didn't play really bad. But I mean, like. If it was an awesome show, I always knew TJ's going to do something that you're not expecting. Mm -hmm. Just be ready to vibe with it. Yeah. And I remember uh, we played this show at Trees and like verse two of one of the songs, he did this drum groove over it. I'd never heard before. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. But I was just like, this is what I'm talking about. You got it. And so you're like yeah. you're saying, just depending on the night and how it's feeling, sometimes yeah. the song will do something different. We had a, a guy that played drums with us for a while. Um, one of my buddies from college named Steve Baker. He's arguably one of the most versatile and talented drummers I've ever met. Um, the fun thing about playing gigs with Steve, you never know quite what he's going to do. You just know you're going to like it. Yeah. And those are my favorite kind of drummers to play with. It's like, I'm not worried about you like getting the parts right or getting the song structure right. But there's little moments like, all right, what's Steve going to do here? Yeah, the guy yeah. that's playing with us now, Carlos, he does the same thing. Like he'll... Like if, if, if we're really, if, if the boys are buzzing that night, Carlos will do something just absolutely stupid. And we're all just like, yeah, that's dude. awesome. That's yeah. awesome. It's, it's when you have good musicians playing fun music together and you have those moments where you can kind of throw some, some goofy stuff in there. That's, that's the magic. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's when a show is fun is when you yeah. feel the freedom to improv a thing. And you can it. always see it on the musicians faces too. Like when, when somebody does that, we all just kind of go. Dude, James Motter threw this fill into one of the songs uh, at church Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. That was just like you know the the stink face. Mm -hmm. Like I turned around and but I did that with my mouth open because it was awesome and, <laughs> and I was just like, oh. I've done that a couple times because James used to play drums in City of Auburn. He's filled in on drums here and there when we haven't had a full time drummer. And now he's playing keys with you. Yeah, he plays can, right? keys with us, and it's it's fun because like he is in the band, but he's also not in the band because like he plays when he feels like it. <laughs> or, but he's, I love that he's still in the music video though, and oh, when yeah. he's doing his little like the oh, day yeah. after his car wreck too. Yeah. Ah. Oh, yeah. Gosh. That video is great, by the way. Y'all have great music videos. Thanks. That music video, we we showed up with zero agenda. We're like, okay. Let's do like a few like, you know, single shots of the band, you know, playing the song, but then the rest is just pure chaos. Because we were at the backstage of a church and they just had all these props laying around. We were like, all right. That's a great we idea. We improv the whole thing. It worked. It is fun. That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, uh, we've we've got that record hopefully coming out at some point next year. We're not we're still mapping out a an actual release plan, but I know we're gonna try to get another single out here in a couple months and then just 
uh, we're, we're starting to just, we're always writing. Like we're always just bouncing ideas around. Like I had a couple ideas I worked on the other night that I sent to the guys and they're like, yeah, these are cool. But we always have like a succession of just like, here's a part, here's a part, here's a part. I don't know if they go together, but they're cool parts so we can do with something with them later. Yeah. Yeah. I have so. several sessions under my word stuff that'll mm-hmm. have like a, a song title, but when you open it on the timeline, there's mm-hmm. like three totally different parts. Yeah. I don't know if it's all the same thing. It's just yeah. different ideas that all came in the same brain dump. Yeah. That's kind of how like I'll have like, and it, it's sometimes I just, I, I end up putting them together and flowing them together, even though they may not actually flow together. I, I'll try too. That's what's nice is, is just having extra ideas Mm -hmm. with words. What I'll do is I'll like put the one word title Mm -hmm. that, and it's usually like what I'm feeling or something. And then I'll just try to make things that sound like that, but they don't all have to sound the same, but Mm -hmm. sometimes you can pull them, pull them together. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, so you mentioned earlier, you were talking about being in a homeschooled community. Yeah. As someone who spent time in a homeschooled community, (laughs) I want to know what you have to say about yours and what was it and all that. So, we kind of waffled around through a bunch of different kind of iterations of the homeschool community of varying degrees and intensities of fundamentalism. Hmm. Um, Emphasis on the fun. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and we, we only started home. My, my parents only started homeschooling us kind of just out of necessity. Cause when I was three, Uh, And I have an older sister. She's two years older than me, so she was five at the time. We ended up moving to France, uh, and we were supposed to be there for three years. And I think at the time, like, French schools were not good, and my sister was supposed to be starting school at the time. And um, there was going to be a lot of a language barrier, and French people didn't really take too kindly to English speakers for whatever reason. I've heard Um, So they're like, "We'll, we'll just homeschool while we're here and just kind of simplify that. Uh, we ended up only li- being there for about three months. We were supposed to be there for three years. Oh, wow. Um, it was for a work project my dad was assigned to, and when we got there, it just turned out that that project wasn't quite ready to go. So they moved us back, um, but we just stuck with the homeschooling thing and just kind of leaned into it. Um, and there were a lot of elements of it that I really liked that worked really well for a neurodivergent brain like I am I have, um, and that I was... That, like the things that came naturally to me, I was able to progress with faster, mm-hmm. but things that I struggle with, I could take my time with and figure out. Yeah. Um, that's where I benefited a lot. For sure. Yeah. Um, like by the time my mom sat me down to teach me to ha- how to start reading, I already knew how to read cause I heard her teaching my sister and I just kind of through osmosis picked it up. Um, and, uh, so that, that side of things was really really helpful. Like the actual education I received was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, like the, the book knowledge I received was excellent. Do you know what curriculum y'all used? Oh, we did. We tried so many dude. Um, and it's funny cause we'll, we'll get into the, uh, the, the, the bigger organization we ended up in started as uh, a curriculum pitch from another group of friends that we were involved with. And a lot of it was tied to what church we were at at the time. Cause we, we church hopped a good bit mm. as a kid. Um, but where it, are you living at this time in your, in so your thinking? when I, well, w- w- this would have been, w- I mean, I started w- whenever we started homeschooling, we, we were living in North Carolina. I was born in North Carolina. Okay. Um, where in North Carolina? In the Raleigh area, kind of like w- where this is to Dallas, like where, okay. what that place is to Raleigh is called this little town called Apex. Mm. Um, and I got Lyme disease in Gastonia. Nice. That's not far from where my mom grew up. Oh, cool. Um, and then we moved to Allen in August of 02, uh, when I turned, I turned seven, two weeks after we moved here. Um, and then, and we just kind of went with it. We tried a couple different churches, ended up at this one that had a lot of other families that homeschooled. So we just kind of we're asking them, like, hey, what are y'all doing? Is this working for y'all? And they're like, yeah, this is cool. And so we just kind of went with it. Um, and there were a few friends we met along the way that um, kind of started leaning into a much more uh, a much more conservative bent on things and a much more um, antiquated slash traditional uh, method of things. And 
these were people that we trusted. Mm-hmm. And we we're like, well, if it's working for them and we trust them, let's give it a shot. It might work for us too. Um, and that led us into um, a circle of people that um, were all involved in an organization called the Institute in Basic Life Principles. Uh, IBLP, they had a, a homeschool curriculum called the Advanced Training Institute, or ATI. Um, I had to know somebody involved in this. At some I'm point, sure you like. did. I'm sure you did. It was huge around here through the kind of the early 2000s and in the 90s too, but that was before we got here. I got here in 97, okay. but I didn't homeschool until like 2002 or something. Okay. Like um, and this, this organization was had been going on since like the 70s. Uh, it started off just kind of this guy kind of uh, trying to figure out uh, why all the, the youths of the day um, were having so many troubles, and he thought it was due to their uh, disrespect of authority. Mm. So there's a big focus on uh, respecting authority, a.k.a. parents. Um, and the the IBLP, have you seen that diagram that's like the, the umbrella diagram where it's like God, the... The, the head of the household, the mom and the kids, like, have you seen that? Uh, maybe. That break? I, they were the ones that originated that. All right. Uh, basically insinuating and very expressly stating that um, all figures of leadership in your life have been placed there by God and are therefore... Um, the people in charge always the, have these ideas. The people, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it, it, it only makes sense when you need it to make sense. Yeah. Um, but basically, if, if they're in a position of authority in your life, you're not to question them. You're to do as they say, because they are kind of between you and God. They're, they're kind of the—they've uh, the, been placed there by God specifically for that, um, which leads to a lot of uh, really, really great problems. Oh, I'm sure. Um, that took many years for us to really—that that have taken years and years to fully— on earth. Um, those are like problems within the community itself. And even internally in the way that I interact with authority figures in my life. Um, and this also ties into neurodivergence, which was not a thing according to them. Hmm. Um, or according to really any church communities we grew up in, it was all either, uh, a lack of discipline by the parents or uh, a lack of obedience by the kid. Um, yeah, I never heard about that growing up. And then even ADD and ADHD, there was like no sympathy for mm-mm. it. It was just like. Cause nobody tried to understand. Yeah. Nobody wanted to, because if they did, it, it would have uprooted the way that they were structuring their lives. Um, but from that, uh, we were talking about, um, RSD, uh, yeah. rejection sensitivity dysphoria, that coupled with a power dynamic in which you have no voice at the table is a recipe for all sorts of mental health issues and all sorts of boundary issues, um, which I didn't really understand until my early 20s. What does your inner dialogue sound like, if you don't mind me asking? Like, how do you, how do you treat yourself? Better than I used to. Okay. I've taken a lot of time to work on I that. feel like the RSD plus the not being able to have a voice yeah. could make some crazy internal yeah, conversations. Yeah, yeah. And it, there's the, the, the one that I still deal with a lot is like if something around me goes wrong, I can very easily convince me myself that it's my fault, mm. regardless of my involvement or not. But like if somebody tells me, hey, you did this wrong, I just assume they're right. Interesting. Or, yeah. or to combat that, sometimes I'll go too far to the other end and I'll be defensive for no reason when it's really just a, oh yeah, sorry, won't happen again. Um, so I had to work really hard on that. I was a very stubborn and defensive child and a very stubborn and defensive teen. I've been that's kind of been a, a an unhealthy defense mechanism that would kick in a lot for me. But it's because I was feeling that lack of. Uh, agency i guess a lot as a kid and um and these are all i I, my my parents and i we we talked a lot of this out Mm and um luckily we were able to get a lot of this out on the table and work through that before my dad passed away 
Uh, and I think if we hadn't, that would have made his passing a lot harder for me, knowing that I wasn't able to get back to good terms. Because well, there, awesome. there was a lot of discord between me and them about a lot of this. Um, but we've worked through a lot of that. And my mom and I still have really good conversations about this to this day. Um, another part of the whole conglomerate of the uh, the homeschool organization I ended up in is they had like a, a homeschooled version of Boy Scouts. That was, was it Awanas? No, 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 no. Okay. This is called Alert. Uh, uh, they started yeah. off as like a almost just kind of like a local like aid for uh, first responder. Okay. Things like like if uh, like uh, the in the area that they're based out of, there's a lot of like tornadoes and stuff like that. So they would help with like tornado cleanup and disaster response stuff. But then kind of turned into like a, almost like a paramilitary group without the guns and it's it's such a meme it, now looking back at it but like there's a whole like ranking structure and then they made a version of it for like for like kids and it basically beats them into submission and you like Gosh. willingly subject yourself to cruel and unusual punishment but you get awards for it so it feels rewarding and you just you're happy to receive validation from some sort of authority figure dude i think sometimes those different groups whether it be and i'm not picking on anybody but whether it be it be homeschool groups or like super um conservative churches mm -hmm. or any time where you can kind of separate from everybody and create your own world mm -hmm. there's always something mm -hmm. like that there's always that's, some weird stuff that happens popping yeah. up where it's just like the ranking thing yeah that comes up mm -hmm. i feel like mega churches the way they start like like uh job titles yeah start having yeah, military yeah, yeah. Things. it's a lot like that they love working that stuff yeah out. so uh, they had a camp that they ran every, it was the last full week of April every year. And I went three years in a row and it was, it was called like a leadership training camp, um, where, uh, it was just, it was very militaristic and in the way everything was run, like there was like uniforms and room inspections and all this unnecessary, uh, character building stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing that was interesting with this group is that in order to participate, your dad had to be a part of it as well. Uh, but for this camp, dads could go, but they weren't required to go. Mm -hmm. um, first year, I went by myself. You had to be 13. It was only for ages 13 through 18, I think. I went the first year, and like you end up like hiking like 30 miles with a bunch of stuff on back in, in a backpack. Like It's like a backpacking kind of thing, mm -hmm. which is fun in and of itself uh, if it's not basically under the guise of... Uh, uh, R religious character building. Yeah. yeah like you, you kind of thinking of Ben Stiller and heavyweights when they're going <laughs> on the hike. <laughs> um, but my dad went with me the second year and that was when we kind of started to be like, Hey, I don't, I don't think this is what we believe. Yeah. He saw it and was like, Oh yeah. It, and so like, there were a lot of like a, a lot of like teaching sessions. We'd come back to our room from him. He'd be like, Hey, they said this, that's no, we're not into that. And so he and I kind of started to see through some of that. Um, but then sh a couple months after we got back from that, he had a stroke. Oh no. Um, so he was not able to go with me the next year. Um, and I went that year and I came back and I was like, yeah, I'm out. I'm done. This is, this is so there, something feels very wrong. I can't fully articulate it, but he trusted me enough to be like, all right, cool. We're done. We're out. That's awesome. Um, and so we, we left that, uh, we left that behind and we kind of started to part ways with that, uh, that circle of people. I was the only one still kind of involved in that, that whole group ideology thought basis and really theology, uh, affected me the most out of the whole family. Cause I was 11 or 12 when we got involved in it. And that's very formative like uh neuro pathway developing years mm -hmm. um and the rest of my family was kind of at a point where they could kind of chew up the meat spit out the bones move on um but i bought the whole thing hook line and sinker and it wasn't evident to them that that was the case until years later yeah um, well i mean at that age you're still reality is what people tell you it is yeah because you're just... You're still learning how to negotiate with yourself. You're still practicing long sentences. Yeah. And and hoping you understand the words you're using to say them the right way. Yeah, like you, your biggest... Con the your biggest concerns at that age are... Um, uh, how, how cool is my first car going to be? And uh, when can I get the heck out of my parents' house? Yeah, when I was 12, I was just like... 
wanting to be a sponsored skater. Oh yeah. And like I just playing I wanted, in a band. Yeah, I just wanted to play guitar, drive cool cars and play baseball. Like that's that that was yeah, my, dude, that was my life. We're so close to the exact same. Yeah. Way. And I forget we have the kin, uh, the, the baseball connection. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I played baseball for 10 years. My dad coached yeah, most too. of it. My dad coached for like the first half of it. <laughs> and as I got older, he was always there and would help at practice, but he wasn't. Yeah. I don't think he was. But yeah, so we we kind of parted ways with with that organization, but a lot of our friends were either still involved or had been deeply involved for many, many years, and we were still close with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So while we weren't a part of that organization anymore, the ethos and the ideology that embodied that was embodied by that group was still very present in our lives. And those were people that I was given the impression that I needed to trust and needed to find value in as um, influences in my life. So while we did leave the organization, we didn't leave the mindset. And even into the next church that we went to, um, which um, was kind of the same idea, but kind of sugar-coated and like the fundamentalism on low batteries is what I call it. Okay. Um, like when your pedal starts dying. Yeah, kind of, kind of the um, like uh, when you get start getting a scratchy volume pot on your guitar, it's, mm. it's that kind of thing. It's that weird spot where it's like it's kind of coming through, but not really. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of those same ideas were still taught in that church, just in a much more uh, uh, diplomatic package. Um, to the point where, like, when I was in. I was in my freshman year of college uh, and I was coming home every weekend because I was going to school 45 minutes away um, and come home, get free food, yeah. hang out with family for a bit. Um, but at the same time, I was like, I have so much work to do and I don't really feel like I can focus on that when I'm at home because I want to spend time with my family. But my parents were making me come home every weekend because they didn't quite understand how to like release a child into adulthood yeah um and you're the younger the and i'm youngest, the younger one and my sister yeah. never went away to college um and she still lived at home at this time and so i asked them i was like when does the whole coming home every weekend thing become negotiable because i've got i've got a lot that i need to do and that conversation blew up into basically they because we were still surrounded by a very um authoritarian slash dictatorship approach to parenting mm -hmm. um that conversation blew up and we ended up talking to my youth pastor which that guy was tough um because he at that conversation basically told me independence is an illusion you should shut up and do what your parents tell told you to wow and you and were i was in eight, college. i was 18 and independence i was independence like, is an illusion <laughs> that's what he told me oh. and i was like cool I don't trust you anymore. Yeah, what a bummer. Um, which, that is about the age people you look up to, you start going, ah, oh, shoot. Yeah. They're, they're not that cool anymore. Because they start saying things that, that, for whatever reason, stop resonating with you. Yeah. And the that part of growing up, that kind of 18 to really 23, 24, at least for me, was learning how to identify why things stop resonating with me. Hmm. Um, and that was a long process. I didn't really start coming to grips with a lot of the whys until a couple years ago. Oh, wow. Um, and so kind of the, the, the overall kind of journey was like, we kind of started kind of, you know, mainline, normal evangelical folks, and then we kind of, took a, a, a nice hefty swan dive into uh, the nether regions of fundamentalism. Um, and if anybody listening to this wants to know more about IBLP or ATI, there's a whole documentary about it on uh, Amazon Prime called Shiny Happy People. Okay. Because um, there was a, a family that had a TV show called uh, 19 Kids and Counting. They had, they yeah, had remember, 19 kids. Yeah, I remember that show. Um, that family was like the poster child for this organization. Oh, were they a part of that? Yeah, they were. They oh, were the. Wow. They were the selling point. Wow. Um. So and like I, I've met them a couple times. Whoa! Um, all nineteen of them? No, just one or two of them. Hmm. Um. But having gone through <laughs> you didn't that, see its full form. 
every every step I took out of that felt like a breath of fresh air until I realized I'm like, oh no, I'm still swimming on the bottom of the ocean. It's just a shallower part of the ocean. Hmm. Um, and that leads to a lot of uh, a lot of cognitive dissonance as you try to negotiate with the real world and the real world not really operating the way that your little insulated bubble has worked your whole life. Yeah. And realizing that not only have you ignored a vast percentage of humanity, you've withheld a lot of good from yourself. Um, and it's hard to battle the regret and to counteract that with gratitude that at least you've arrived at some point. Yeah. Um, and that's that's been what the last couple years have kind of been for me is just realizing like, yeah, life has not been kind for a, a significant portion of this, but my life is so beautiful and wonderful now that if somebody told me you've got to relive the last 10 years of your life in order to maintain the path you're on now, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Because the amount of good that has come into my life through all of the heartache and all of the turmoil has has made me realize how good this life can be and how much mm. better it could even get. Like, I, I thought it was good, you know, four or five years ago, and now I'm like, whoa. I could that's never awesome. have seen how good this could get. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm so glad that... So, so you feel like you're at that place right now? Yeah, and it's and it's it, it's only up from here. It's 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 good now. How much better can we make it? That's how awesome. how can I? It's the it's the one percent rule. Can you make today one percent better than yesterday? Yeah. Can you be one percent better at that today than you were yesterday? I kind of started doing that. I don't think I used it. I framed it that way, but I don't know how many years ago. But at a certain point, I realized that I was like, every day, I was like. Or it really wasn't even every day. It was as I went to bed, I would like mm -hmm. think through the day and be like, okay, what? Where was I not as good as I could have been? And what yeah. can I do better? Tomorrow? Yeah, developing that self-awareness was really tough for me because I didn't have to have that self-awareness growing up because everything was so strictly regulated for me that it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, do you think part of you being homeschooled though and having to teach yourself to help... <laughs> growing up learning to teach yourself helped you when it came time to identifying needing self-awareness for yeah. things and yeah I think it did because my my sense of self was not based on the people around me um while I do feel like I lacked a lot of socialization as a kid and socialization isn't just being around people it's being around a diverse group of people yeah, yeah, yeah. um it's learning how vast the world around you can be it's yeah. not just, oh, you know how to talk to people. It's like, how, how many different kinds of people are you comfortable talking with and welcoming into your circle? Mm -hmm. um, I, where I lacked in that, I had a lot more time inside my own head. Um, and I think, I think that helped with kind of being able to pick apart complex ideas that I was struggling to articulate and a lot of times it would be, and th this is where the connection to music comes in, is a lot of times it would be a thing I didn't really know I was feeling, and then I'd hear a song that somehow articulated something. I was like, that's it. I've been feeling that. That's what's so great about those like Jeff Rickley lyrics mm -hmm. or um, just the bands we liked, the way they wrote lyrics. They had mm -hmm. their meaning, but they left enough room for you yeah. to kind of just see a, a, a drawing yeah. in their words and go, I think that makes sense to me this way. It's, you're putting together stuff in your own life using words that they're using. Yeah, it's the Dave Grohl thing. The fun thing about music is you can play a song to 80,000 people and they'll sing it back at you for 80,000 different reasons. There you go. And yeah. there, was a, there was a record that, that really kind of, at, at the moment that it came out, really articulated a lot of things I was feeling. And it still today is my favorite record of all time. It's Colony House's uh, When I Was Younger. Oh, cool. um, and that's Stephen Curtis Chapman's yeah. sons. Um, and that was their debut album. I we played a show. Lisa, these played a show with them at mm -hmm. A and M, uh, mm -hmm. and TJ kept going up to them and working in 
Stephen Curtis Chapman's song titles <laughs> <laughs> and the stuff he was saying to them. That's awesome. He'd be like, dude, I'm diving in, man. And just he would just say little things. And I was like, stop doing that. But, dude, they were phenomenal. Oh, I'd never so... even heard of them before. Dude, they're so I just good. knew we were playing with Stephen Curtis Chapman's kid. Yeah. Or, or boys. Or yeah. His, so two of them, one's the singer, one's the drummer. Yeah. They were uh, awesome. I, I Andy saw... Minio played that show, too. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Um, I saw them at the Curtain Club. Uh, oh, wow. And, I miss that venue. Oh man, I love that place. We played so many shows there. Yeah, that was a fun place. Um, I was the first person to show up for general admission because I had nothing. It was a day off. I was like, oh, I'll show up early, see if I can talk to them for a minute. And they were all just standing outside. I just started chatting with them, and uh, I was talking to Kayla. I was like, yeah, like I, I grew up. I basically every I, I attribute like eighty percent of what I know on the guitar to your dad. And he's like, dude, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, 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 that's so funny. That's but really cool. There, that record, because a lot of that record is, is a is kind of a grieving process because one of their younger siblings passed away when I they know. were younger, and a lot of the lyrics on that album are kind of negotiating that grieving process and like, how do I, how do I move forward from this? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, that that record really helped me understand because what I was grieving wasn't necessarily the loss of a a loved one or a family member because my dad was still alive at the time it was grieving almost kind of like a lost adolescence in a sense because I the the ideology I grew up around especially in IBLP was um like you were a kid and then you just needed to be an adult like it kind of deleted. They didn't really believe in the adolescent years. They were like, "You're a kid. Okay, you need to be an adult now." Hmm. And it was all just this. Uh, I later come to describe it as behavior funneling, where if they see you doing things that don't fit the mold of what they're trying to get you to be, they try to redirect you back to other behaviors that they find acceptable. And they do this more extremely to to women than they do to men. Yeah. Um. And there's a lot that ties into like uh, analyzing the Enneagram with all of that that I've kind of dove into internally. Um, Did they they use Enneagram? No, 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 no. no okay. They would they would write where, that off. Where so did you quickly. learn about Enneagram? I learned about it from a coworker when I worked uh, at a, a media company. Um, oh, cool. And the more I started to read about that and understand that, and as I was kind of going through a lot of internal turmoil and transformation and um and analysis i started to see a lot of patterns of how the enneagram ever interacted with the world around me growing up and i didn't I, it wasn't something i was aware of or a, a way of a lens with which i could view people and interactions and relationships but i started to see how the circles i grew up in and the church broadly at least in my experience growing up inherently rewards and punishes certain Enneagram types based on gender. Mm. Um, And that's where the behavior funneling kind of came in where it's like, okay, if you're like this, we need you to be like this. So we're going to keep redirecting you this way and hopefully you get there. Um, And that was a really interesting realization to come to um, because I started to see the Enneagram and seeing the beauty and all the the varieties of the ways that humans can interact with their emotions with other people with themselves i found that really fascinating and i was like that should be leveraged that yeah. should be that should that's the glue that keeps us all together and keeps us moving but everyone i grew up around was like if you're not this this or this you're wrong hmm. or sinning yeah um and that kind of obfuscates what that even means. Um, and the longer I sat with that, the more I was like, it's going to be kind of hard for me to buy into that because I have a hard time thinking that a good God could create such a variety of humans and we are only supposed to be like three or four kinds of them. Yeah. That's that. I can't, I can't, I can't vibe with that. I can't, I can't reconcile. That doesn't, there's too much those those ideas clash too much in in my opinion god can either be good or we can be right about that yeah yeah i think that just i, I think it happens 
I mean, I don't know. Yeah. But it feels like it comes from one guy with one personality mm-hmm. trait and one thought uh, outlook on thing gets a rationalization that seems to make sense to him. Mm-hmm. And then just every other type of person has to fall in line with that. Well, and a lot of it ties is tied into how can that person maintain the power that they've amassed for themselves. Yeah, that And too. if they can consolidate humans into you need to be like this or you need to be like this, that's way easier to control. I believe uh, er- Eric's wife was was in this exact uh, group you're talking organization? about. Organization? That's the word. Interesting. I'd, I would be very fascinated to, to hear about her experience because everybody's... i ex- listen to y'all talk about oh, it. Oh, dude, it would be wild. It'd be there. Some of the the stuff that happened within that organization that seemed so normal to us at the time, we look back and we're like, "We did what?" Dude? Yeah, I have a few of those. Probably not like that. <laughs> I'd love to know more. <laughs> I don't want to make you hash oh, no. it up. Though. Oh, dude, I it's 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 such a fever dream to me at this point. Like, I, even watching the documentary when it came out because it just came out a couple months ago. I was watching back through. and I was like, "Holy crap!" I was so deep into all of this. Yeah. And I look at myself now, I'm like, if you told me I would look like this 10 years later, I'd have, I'd have told you to go take a hike. Yeah. You're... And now I'm like, this is kind of what I've always wanted to be. I just didn't think I was allowed to. Dude, I remember telling Jason Hobbs, it's so funny you bring that up. I remember <laughs> I was hanging out with Jason Hobbs in my backyard when we lived in Sherman. And uh, it was really late at night and I had that half an acre and I missed mm. that house so much. And we were just out on the land and I was like, dude. Because we've been friends since we were like 12 or something. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, dude, you, when you were like 14, if you knew you were going to, you'd be so proud of how, because, you know, he just looks so cool with his hair, yeah. his tattoos, his earrings, his beard and everything. I was like, you would have been stoked yeah. to know that this was who you were going to be. And Jason's the epitome of cool where like he could wear anything and it's just cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a real, uh, just, I, there's certain people I knew there's, growing up. that There's an, a non-arrogant. They could borrow someone's clothes and they still look cool. And, and Yeah. The, the it's it's a borrowed. non-arrogant confidence. Yeah. Yeah. That's a cool, yeah, one. cool. One yeah, have. the I, it would be really interesting, like, for you to like be able to like be in the middle of a conversation of two people who both experienced that life and that organization. Yeah, because there's so much of it that, like, to our brains, we're like, oh yeah, that's just how it was, and everyone else is like, it's that the the meme of that cat going, huh? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you guys would be like, yeah, us too. I totally remember that. And we'd all be like, you guys said what? Yeah, if y'all ever get together, I'm going (laughs) to... That would be very fascinating. I'm standing around, that's why. (laughs) I'm a very curious curious person. Yeah, again, it feels like a fever dream now because I'm so far removed from from that and from... Well, it's very cool that you're, you have such a positive outlook on everything yeah. right now. And I'm so glad you're feeling really great about everything, Yeah, too. It, it, I have... It, there's no reason not to. Like, yeah, the world's all kind of, you know, crumbling around us at, in a lot of ways. But that's no reason to to stop trying to make it better. Yeah, and there's still beauty in it. Yeah. And enjoying that beauty and creating Absolutely. moments. Absolutely, yeah. The artist, you know, you get to create some of that. Mm -hmm. You get to kind of create your own. It didn't exist and now it does because of you. Yeah. And you want it to be beautiful and that's bringing beauty and and love into this world. Yeah. And it's, it's trying to capture the human experience. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. Because I think back to like the first time I heard that Colony House record and it was articulating so many things I was feeling that I didn't realize needed articulating. If I can provide that for somebody else, I've done my job. Oh, awesome. That's that's what it's about to me. It's it's connecting people to each other and connecting people to themselves through some sort of creative means that makes them feel something that means something to them. That's so cool, man. Yeah. Well, do you have anything coming up that you're looking forward to in life or with City of Auburn or at, just at all? What, uh, do you got, got what are the, you looking forward got, to? Got the Emory Show. Uh, I'm really excited to sit down and write another record. Um, write new material because the the record we're about to put out is technically old material that we just kind of uh, threw a little bit of extra spice on top of. Um, I'm really excited to see what new City of Auburn material sounds like because we haven't really written new material since before COVID. Mm. Uh, Because most of Where Does It Hurt we wrote either in the midst of COVID or a lot of those ideas originated well before COVID. Um, 
so I'm, I'm really interested to see just with all the influences we've all picked up with all the stuff we've put out since then and kind of the experiences we've had with what works and what doesn't for our sound and how we can expand our sound. Cause that's one thing we're trying to do is um, we want to add at least five or 10, five to 10% to our sonic landscape every record. Yeah. I think that's so cool. Um, so we all listen to a bunch of really weird stuff too. Mm-hmm. Like stuff that's like, you wouldn't think guys who play in an alt rock band would listen to this, but we do like, when we're on tour and Mike's driving, it'll go from the 1975 to black metal in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and for me, it'll go from like John Mayer to Owl City to Meshuggah and then back to my usual 2000s alt rock, like Amberlin, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Um, but we want to try to expand a little bit, but it still makes sense. And it still feels like us, but it feels new and feels inventive because we're not trying to do the same thing over and over again. We're yeah, not trying yeah. to do the Breaking Benjamin thing where like when Breaking Benjamin puts a record out, you know exactly what you're getting and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> but, it's pretty impressive of some people. No effects is like that. Yeah. It's like you're going to get no effects and you're going to like it. If you like it, you're yeah. going to like it. Yeah. And it's like they do that thing and that thing's really cool. I like that thing. Mm-hmm. But what I'm trying to do is, and this is I saw an interview with John Mayer. He said the reason it takes him so long to put a record out is he won't put a new record out until he finds something he hasn't tried yet. No, that's cool. And that's kind of what we're wanting to do is we want to add more real estate to our sonic landscape, Hmm. Um, which is hard to do because it's a lot of trial and error and it takes a long time to write. And we are the kind of band like we don't write on the fly. When we get to the studio record everything, every part, everything has been written. Mm-hmm. And it's just a matter of getting the best part of that recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, but, well, I mean, if because we work with Matt Goldman, inevitably things are going to get tweaked along yeah, the way. Yeah, but yeah, the but basis of it, wanna... it's, it's all there. Yeah. Yeah, I've had the best experiences when you show up with as much as possible ready, yeah. but also willing to let it evolve. Yeah. So, excited to try to write new stuff. Um Enjoying the cat dad life. I just got two cats a couple months ago. Um, cats rule. Can we pause? I have to pee so bad. Okay. We were um, saying. We, we were saying that uh, you're excited for to write again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to kind of see what sort of things we can add into the kind of the avenues that we can go down that make sense for our music and that... Um, still feel like us, but also feel fresh and um, creative and experimental in a way. But yeah, excited for that. That's Just, awesome. You know, life's good, man. I, I really, I, I live, I'm, I live a pretty simple life. I, you know, I work in a restaurant, play music with my friends. Got your cats. Got the cats. What are their names? Smitty Werben Jaegerman Jensen, because he was number one. He was. And Swiffer Wet Jet, TM. <laughs> That's the best. Smitty That's and the Swiffer, best, they're... Oh my god, they are menaces, but I love them so much. They're they're complete goofballs, and they act... Have you got the Christmas tree out? Oh god, no. Just wait. No. I don't really even have a spot for one in my apartment. I'm going to get you the uh, Charlie Brown one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a Christmas tree up at some point. My, my girlfriend is a gigantic Christmas fanatic. And like, I'm weird. Like Christmas is... It's not that I hate Christmas. It's that Christmas kind of lost its magic for me at some point. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I, I've had that experience over the last many years. And my rule for like when it is officially Christmas is it's not Christmas until I have digested and expelled my Thanksgiving dinner. Hmm. Um, that's cool. That's a good rule. Th- that's of that's kind of I. It's because one thing that is that's weird with like the. ADHD that I have is like hearing the same Christmas songs over and over again is so overstimulating to me. Yeah. It makes me, and, and, but hear, hearing the same versions of the same songs over and over again, it, it, it hurts my brain. Like I feel pain inside of my, inside of my brain when that happens. My dad went to the grocery store one time to get our family some food and he came home later and it took a while and we were like, mm-hmm. what, what happened? And he was like, I went to Tom Thumb and I walked in and they were playing Firework for Katy Perry, mm-hmm. and he left and went to a different grocery <laughs> <laughs> He was like, that yeah. song just makes him just hear and heard that. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, just yeah. that. Yeah, he says it feels like she's yelling at him. and yep. he was stressed. And- well, and that's that's one of the things I love playing the the Christmas services with Chase Oaks. Is it's always something. It's like okay, here's it feels like Christmas music, but we're gonna make it a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really it, like that Hark Hallelujah. Yeah. one. Yeah, that um, one's fun. That's a good one. But uh, yeah. yeah, just you know, pl- plunking along doing the thing, and uh, trying to make the most out of every every day that I get. Well, dude, it seems like that. And I just wanted to tell you that I love being your friend. You're an amazing songwriter, guitar player, musician. I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. Proud of you. I appreciate that. And you too, man. It's like, fun getting to be around you more. I'm so glad. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a. Uh, it's it's good to have. It feels good to have good people, and it feels good to to feel safe and to feel uh, like there's not anything about yourself that you have to hold back from people. That's that's been the biggest revelation over the last couple of years is like I get to I get to determine who I keep in my life and the people I keep in my life are the people that I don't I don't hold any punches with. Well, I, I'll tell you as being on the other side, I, it's more fun. Yeah. To be around someone who feels like they can be their whole self. Yeah. And safe. Cause I feel like you get the best out of yeah. out of them. And it's, it really works both ways. Yeah. You're, you're, you're getting a hundred percent of that person a hundred percent of the time. Mm-hmm. And th- those are the kind of people you want to keep around because those are the people that get the best out of you too. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for being my friend. Of thanks for thanks coming for, on this. Thanks for having me on, dude. This has been awesome. This is cool. Yeah, I'm man. glad we did it. Well, thanks, hey, dude. Hey, oh. <laughs> No, I'm just <laughs> for such an amazing show that's one of the dumbest things that, that they ever came up with was that freaking that, that's me I can take things from being great to just being completely off the rails dumb in an instant